Well, we are in uh, the fifth week of our study of Ephesians. And the last two weeks, Carrie has taught on uh, chapters 3 and 4. I will be uh, teaching on chapter 5, or should I say one verse in chapter 5. But don't get your hopes up, because I'm going to stretch it out over a good 20 minutes or so. <laughs> Uh, this week, I did not, well, I told Carrie that I didn't need any slides then. He apparently thought I didn't need a title slide. So while I was waiting for church, I came up with that beautiful slide right there. So yeah, it's very weather appropriate. <laughs> Well, just think positive, and you'll have weather like that. I also didn't come up with any slides. I took a cue from, uh, we've been doing uh, Chip Ingram study for our men's group, which to do a quick little promo for that, if you are a guy and you have your Wednesdays free, we're doing a study going through Chip Ingram, why I believe. It's very good. Uh, he tends to uh, have these worksheets where you fill in the blanks. And I thought that was kind of a neat idea. And if you want a, a solid, kind of deep Bible study, and if you're a fellow, then I recommend that very much. If you're uh, a lady, I recommend that you put on a fake beard or mustache <laughs> and some shoulder pads from... Your, that jacket you had in the 1980s and come on over because I've heard the ladies class and they laugh and smile way too much to actually be learning anything. So... <laughs> this is your learning face. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it doesn't go the other way around. So, this week, I'm focusing on one of my favorite verses. And it has to do with time. And I was thinking this week about what we value in our life, aside from our relationship with God, and our relationship with each other, with our family and our friends. The things we tend to value seem to be so unimportant compared to time. A lot of us value our jobs. Well, we value our status. Less importantly, a lot of us value our hobbies uh, or our interests. As of uh, recently, at least until the last few weeks, uh, all of us probably valued our interest in the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> and <laughs> we can see the payoff in that at the end of the football season. I was going to make a little jab at Grayson, but unfortunately he's not here <laughs> for uh, his poor Patriots losing. <laughs> I, I don't take any joy in that at all. <laughs> the, uh, another thing we value is our stuff. I, I, I understand valuing our job and uh, even your status. But we, a lot of people put value in their stuff. We put value in if we have the latest Samsung phone or the latest iPhone. And I know at least a few of you probably are quite proud of your televisions, which those things aren't necessarily bad. But if we put too much value on them, they're not necessarily good either. 
And the last thing that we value is related to the first two things. And we've learned this past month that people will spend hundreds, some people thousands of dollars for the chance at winning one and a half billion dollars. <laughs> they value their money that much <laughs> that they'll waste it in uh, hopes, in the vain hopes of winning a billion dollars. Which, all these things, like I say, they're not bad. But the thing I think we should value most is time. I think time for the human race is a great equalizer. Those three people that just won, I don't remember. I think one of them took a measly half, mil half billion dollars, and the others got about a billion. Even those people, even Bill Gates, at the end of the day, his money can't buy him another 10 hours on a day. We can't add to the amount of time we have. The doctors say we can take away time with our bad habits. I've probably taken away a good three or four days eating bacon double cheeseburgers. <laughs> so I guess you can, the doctors say take away days. Uh, it's one of those things, I don't think anyone in this room thinks they have enough time. But strangely, it's the thing that we have the same amount of. Near as I can tell, all of us have 24 hours in a day. I broke this down. 24 hours in a day, 1,440 minutes. I didn't go all the way down to seconds. I'm not that anal. <laughs> but it's one of those things that's incredibly finite. We don't get any more. We don't get any less. And later on, I'll get to the, the fact that we don't know how much time we actually have. So that's what I'm going to put the focus on. The verse I'm, uh, if you have your notes uh, in front of you, the first verse that I'm putting the emphasis on is Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. I'm changing things up a little bit. This, this week I'm reading from the New King James. So all you uh, King James type people can not look at me funny. Uh, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. When you're reading the, this is an aside, when you're reading the Bible, for your devotional or whatever you do. Uh, scripture should be like potato chips where you can't eat just one. So it's always good, whether Carrie's teaching or I'm teaching or you're doing your daily bread, to read ahead and read backwards. So Paul, in this section, he gives a lot of great advice, which I don't even have to preach. He, he says we should be imitators of God. We should walk in love. We should avoid sexual immorality, uncleanness. We shouldn't covet. We should watch the way we speak. We should avoid idolatry. And that we should walk as children of the light and not walk, in the, walk as darkness. And I encourage all of you to go back and read that because unless you're one of the zero people in this room 
that doesn't struggle with any of those things, I think it's worth, it, it's a very practical advice, which I don't even have to preach because it's just there. But I'm putting the emphasis on this one verse, which is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. And I love the way it's worded. So since this is a study in Ephesians, I'm going to break it down a little bit, and then we'll talk about the practical points. Paul says, See then that you walk circumspectly. I believe it was someone who said, you ought to learn one $5 word a day. So I'm doing my due diligence, and circumspectly is your $5 word of the day. If you're reading any other translation, it's a big word for walk in wisdom, walk wisely. It literally means to walk gently. <laughs> That's the word. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. The reason I chose the New King James for this version, for this message, was I like that phrase, redeeming the time. Other translations will say, make the best use of your time. But I think redeeming the time has a spiritual component to it, that we can use our time for lost causes, for sinful causes, and we have to be redemptive in the use of our time and use it for a higher purpose, for a godly purpose, because the days are evil. Now, that's a very poetic phrase, and it's very true, as we all know, that the days are evil. The days we live in, we do live in an immoral generation. And to those who look back to the good old days, I also have to say every generation has been immoral. So this was as true for Paul as it was for people a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, and 50 years ago. The, we do not live in a world where time is on our side. So in thinking about this, I wanted to come up with, I originally had five points. But I came, I whittled it down to four. Four things that I want you to remember that will help, hopefully, help you to make the best use of your time, to use that in a redemptive way, that at the end of your days, you'll be, you can say, I didn't waste my time, and I used it for the Lord's will. The first one, and if you have a pen, you can use a pen. If you don't have a pen, you can steal one from your friends. We might have some pens back there that you can borrow. And if we run out of those pens, you can just poke your finger and write that way. So the first blank is get the right priorities. So the, the magic word is priorities. And I take this from uh, Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, anyone who will talk to you about time management will say, Get, getting your priorities right is the first thing to effective time management. And that's a good kind of secular wisdom. And I think it's even more true when it comes spiritually. 
Because spiritually, I think a lot of us, we put our priorities in the stuff that I just talked about above. We put a lot of, we make our job our priority. We make our status our priority, becoming a, getting a greater title. And certainly we make, I mean, how many people have, I won't have you raise your hands, how many people of you might have missed a <laughs> church on Sunday for a game? And money is certainly a priority, and I'll admit, you know, I fall into that trap too. Our priorities, we have to seek first the kingdom of God. In both the Old and the New Testament, God says, no matter what is in your life, you need to put me first. In the Old Testament, sacrificial system, and this is not going to be a thing commenting about money or ties or whatever, and it won't be a, a teaching on that, but God required from everyone their first fruits, their absolute best. If they had livestock, they had to give their best lamb to God. If they had grain, they had to give their best grain, which is kind of an upside down kind of thing for Americans because most of us, when our money comes, we don't give off the top. And when our time comes, <laughs> I don't know how many of you are like me, but we get home. I would say we read the newspaper, but newspapers aren't a thing anymore. I think I'm the only person that reads the review anymore. We go on in the internet, uh, have dinner, maybe catch the news. Uh, John's not here, so I can't make fun of him watching American Idol. But you watch whatever you watch, you wash the dishes, and then at the end of the day, you're like, oh, I gotta sneak in. Because, you know, pastor's gonna talk about how I should do the devotional, so I better sneak in some devotional time and five minutes of prayer. It shouldn't be that way. We should wake up, and that should be the first thing on our mind. I'm not saying you have to wake up and do a 50-minute Bible study, but waking up and saying a prayer that you could honor God with your day would certainly help you set your priorities for that day. Uh, there was, uh, to give another plug, we in the men's group we did a series before called Balancing Life's Demands. And he goes into a lot of practical stuff about that. So I think we probably have that somewhere at the church that you could catch if you, you wanted to dig deeper into that. The second point, take sin seriously. That's your second blank. Sin. Take sin seriously. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Sin in our lives I will say this, and it might be controversial. Sin for the Christian, a lot of us, some of us I will say, treat sin, if we grew up in a certain tradition, that if I do so many sins, eventually God's going to cut me off. And we live our lives trying to live so holy 
that we just never have any fun. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I don't believe that if you're simply talking about the amount of sin in your life, that you can ever out-sin God's grace. You can't. If you belong to Christ, and I'm not saying you should do this, but hypothetically, you could do a million sins a day, and you wouldn't even... God wouldn't even need a thimble full of grace for you. But what I am saying, and what the author of Hebrews is saying here, is that sin in our lives weighs us down. If I were to tell you guys, if it was the right time of year, if we were a week away from the Iron Man in Coeur d'Alene, if I were to tell you I'm going to do the Iron Man, would that be a wise or unwise thing to do for me? That would not be very wise <laughs> because weighing as much as I weigh, that I, I would be, you know, killing myself. <laughs> but that's the way a lot of people run their spiritual race. They have habitual sins. They have sins in their life. They have guilt. They have shame that weighs them down. And it causes us to either spend time fighting it or feeling bad about our sin. I'm going to get off camera there for a second. Uh, and it causes us to spend so much time when we should be using it that time, when we can be using that time for God's purposes. We have to realize that every day we're going to deal with sin. There was a uh, if you read my Facebook, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you don't, then you, you can be ignorant and blissfully ignorant in this case. There's a leading presidential candidate who in June or July was asked, do you ask God for forgiveness? And he said, no, I don't ask God for forgiveness. I'm generally a good person, and I don't do many bad things. I might say his, the person who does his hair does bad things, <laughs> but he thinks he doesn't do bad things. But I'm here to tell you, <laughs> and this is no great confession, I do bad things. And the key for all of us is we have to repent daily and look back to the cross and look forward to Christ. Because if we think about, if we dwell on our sin, then it'll just make you feel guilty and you'll just stay still. And the point of the Christian walk is to move forward. The third point, know that your days are numbered. That's the, the last blank, numbered. From Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Each of us is born with an expiration date. When you buy your milk, it says, use by February 10th. And since I'm a single person, sometimes I forget this use by date. And I go to get my cereal, and I smell the milk. That's what single guys do, we smell things. If we want to know if our clothes are clean, we smell them. That will change 
on April 9th. <laughs> So, you love yeah. all of us, but all of us have that expiration date, and we don't know when that expiration date is. I theologically believe that God has our day, and we don't know how many days we have. I believe some of us have 75 years, and some of us have 50 years, and some of us have 25 years. But it doesn't matter how many days you have. It's how you use your days. Because in our society where we're terribly uncomfortable with aging and getting old and dying, we have to realize that it happens. For all of us, it's a reality. For me, at 35, it's a reality. And for those of you who are like Patrick, who I assume he's like, I don't know, seven. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I'm going by the way he acts. Anyway. <laughs> I love you, Patrick. Oh no, I'm I'm a I'm at least ten. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> our days are numbered. And we have to remember that just like in football, to use another football reference, there's only so much time on that clock. And we don't know when our two minute warning is. <laughs> And God's not going to allow us any timeouts. So to know that our days are numbered and that we have to make that use of our time. Uh, some of, I may one day, you may one day, have the doctor tell you that you have six months to live. And from all, all the stories I hear, when people hear that, that's when they start taking life seriously, because they know there's a time limit. But all of us have a time limit, and we have to think about that. Our last point, know that we will be held accountable. That's the last word, accountable. And I, I should say, Carrie and I love a good competition. You know, when we play games, we're, we're competitive. And I thought I would compete with Kerry in the goof-ups he makes with his bulletins sometimes. You'll notice that I put Hebrews 12.1 twice on that paper. You're doing well. Yeah. I mean, I am really keeping up. <laughs> That's supposed to say Hebrews 9.27. <laughs> it is appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about the judgment. Doctrinally speaking, there's two judgments. Generally two judgments, at least. There's the judgment for unbelievers and the judgment for believers. For unbelievers, that determines their experience when they go to eternal punishment. And for believers, that, ex that determines your experience when you get your eternal reward. And if you're like me, when you have to face your supervisor's judgment at the end of the year, I get a little nervous. <laughs> and I admit, when I think about having to face the judgment of God and have to explain there's a verse in the Gospels that says he will ask us to account for every idle word. Every idle word. Even our words will be judged. And it's not one of those things 
It's not like the bumper sticker I saw that says, Jesus is coming soon, look busy. <laughs> That's not going to work. And I also should tell you that doesn't work on your boss either. <laughs> They know you're lazy, Mike. Um, <laughs> oh. Love you, Mike. Uh, <laughs> actually, he's the one who has to deal with the lazy people. So, uh, God knows the quality of our work. It's up to us every day to realize that one day we're going to give an account for that. And I hopefully that will spur you on to doing good works, to having the right priorities, to for repenting of your sin every day, and trying to take that weight off of you, and knowing that we have a time limit, and one day our days will end. There's, and in all this I'm speaking to believers. If you haven't made a decision, I only give one verse, and this isn't in the notes. Second Corinthians six two. For he says, "In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation." You were made for eternity. And today is the day of salvation. Because just like everyone else, you don't know how much time you have. And God is offering his mercy and his forgiveness so that you can have life and have it abundantly. And that's something that we all should think about as well. Father, I ask that you be with us this week.